If you're a healthcare professional involved in treating veins, you've almost certainly heard of Professor Mark Whiteley. Mark is credited with many firsts in the United Kingdom, and he has strong views on how veins should be treated, and is the author of the Whiteley Protocol. Mark has shared his views widely and has promoted his protocol with uncompromising language. I've just come off a video call with him to learn more. Let's start with a taster of what to expect. Are you happy to answer any questions? Is there anything off limits or anything that you might be offended me asking you? You'll answer anything. All right. If, well, if, if you, you okay. 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 All right. Yeah. Are you suggesting, okay. therefore, from that from that data? that 60% of people being treated with endothermal ablation and sclerotherapy or phlebectomies are being treated incorrectly. Totally, absolutely. And if people are brave enough to join the ridiculous things you'll have seen in the uh, uh, correspondence that I've been having with other people who uh, started answering your question, is foam enough? It clearly isn't enough to be only foam sclerotherapy. That just is a ridiculous thing for every patient. It can't possibly be with such a huge range of Venus How disease. much is the fellowship? The actual price is slightly variable depending on the specific needs for the, the person doing it. Um, Ballpark but, figure? Oh, but it's about £10,000 or something like that, I think. If, if they're going for, well, It's something like that. It, um, if they're going for the full one and they're then coming and actually doing the um, observe, observe week and also operating on patients. If the Whiteley Protocol gives the best results in the world with the lowest recurrence, work, recurrence rate in the world, why isn't it more widely used around the world? I don't know. We, we use it. I can't do more than use it myself and teach everybody around me. If other people don't want to use it and learn it... From a purely one. practical and utilitarian approach, there aren't enough vascular technicians, there aren't enough people trained in the Whiteley Protocol, there aren't enough catheters and ablation kits in the world to treat everybody who's currently suffering with a leg ulcer. Isn't it fair to say then that ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is the only practical solution we have to this public health problem uh, well you're, you're asking the wrong person aren't you if you talk talk to a politician or a public health doctor i'm here as i've said right from the beginning the white protocol is based to get the person who is in front of me the very best treatment and the person in front of anybody who i've trained to get the you very think best there's treatment. a lot of dishonesty and fraud amongst doctors then treating veins I don't know, can't answer that. Never How looked. much does it cost for a patient coming off the street to go through the assessments, consultation, it, so it, it, scans? Depends exactly, it depends exactly what's wrong with them, but the basic is something like about 900. I don't know anybody in the UK who treats veins properly, or most do their own quick scan, most only do, you know, they don't, do, they don't do look at the biological element, they only look at the hemodynamic element. Most people who do veins in the UK do not understand veins. Purely and simply, they're trained at a medical school level. They got taught, you know, how to do a few bits and pieces. They do it, and they don't come to the meetings. They don't come to the international meetings. They don't come to the research. Okay, so now you've had a taster. Buckle up, and let's get a deeper understanding of Mark's views. And at the end, I'll share my first thoughts. Uh, are you happy? to answer any questions. Is there anything off limits or anything that you might be offended me asking you? You'll answer anything. So I've been following the lively discussion that you've been having on LinkedIn. And um, I thought it'd be helpful, Mark, for those who don't know uh, what your motivations are in your clinic, uh, just to tell us a little bit about your your background. I know you, you have lots of interests. You, you've got a very detailed research interest into vein disease. Um, you were one of the first to introduce a number of techniques in the UK, uh, endothermal ablation. You've got particular interests in perforator veins, pelvic reflux, and you've published widely on those. So I don't think we need to go into them in detail other than to say that your protocol is on your website and people can go and see it and, and so forth. But Tell me, what is the, how would you describe the Whiteley Protocol to somebody who's not familiar with it? What are the basic elements that make up the Whiteley Protocol that gives the White, Whiteley Protocol the lowest recurrence rate after treatment ever? 
in the world. It's quite simple. It also goes to what you said, which I think is wrong, which is I have lots of interests. I actually have one interest. The interest is that each individual patient in front of me gets the best possible treatment, the best possible outcome. And I think one of the things that's lost in academia is that you end up with groups of patients, you have exclusion criteria, you start sort of just homing in on one bit and then you use the excuse of real world data to ignore certain areas you don't want to, to, to treat yourself. And then by doing that, you sort of get to what I call garbage in, garbage out sort of research. So the whole reason that I look at all these different areas of vein surgery, the whole reason I look at all the different uh, diagnostic tests, the different treatment tests is purely and simply, if there's an area of vein surgery that needs to improve or if see people getting poor outcomes or in the past have poor outcomes, we would then research, find out how to improve that and include it in the protocol. So to answer the protocol side of that, the Whiteley protocol is very, very simple. And as I came up with it about 25 years ago, trademarked it a um, uh, little uh, more recently than that, about 15 years ago. And it's purely and simply, firstly, get someone who is trained properly in doing duplex ultrasound with a proper duplex ultrasound, not a scanner, not one that's, you know, just uh, on the laptop or something, but uh, the highest resolution we get with the highest uh, specification you can get to look at all the different areas of reflux, because if we accept that venous disease comes from mainly reflux, then stasis, then obstruction, and altogether cause inflammation, you don't want to be looking at just the main cause of reflux, which is what a lot of doctors do, just one area. We want to find all the causes of reflux and uh, stasis. So it starts off with, first of all, finding out what's wrong with the patient. And when you see something you don't understand, like parva tissue, or you see something that's slightly abnormal, don't ignore it because you don't know it, but to find out why it's there and how you're best going to treat it and what, from, what problems it can, might cause. So the first thing is of the Whitey Protocol is get a proper diagnosis and a reflux pattern. Then you have a three-stage process. The first is purely and simply anti-reflux or anti-obstruction. And that is basically hemodynamics. So stage one is correct the hemodynamics. Then the second one is correct the stasis and correct the biological effects. So the biological effects include venous stasis and include revascularization, neovascularization, endothelial cell changes that cause recurrences. And then the third is very simply those who need it is then the cosmetic treatment of any thread veins afterwards. And one of the ridiculous things you'll have seen in the uh, uh, correspondence <laughs> that I've been having with other people who uh, started answering your question is foam enough? It clearly isn't enough to be only foam sclerotherapy. That just is a ridiculous thing for every patient. It can't possibly be with such a huge range of venous diseases. So where we got into the conversation, going, he was sort of saying, well, you know, where's the way the protocol? Well, the way the protocol is if every single patient has an individual pattern of disease with different veins of different sizes, different velocities, different wall thicknesses, different sclerosis and everything, a protocol can only be based upon the way a patient goes through it and then using the research we've got pulling together the right tools into those stages to get the patient the right outcome. And to sort of think there's some magic potion that you can just say, oh, do ABC, it's just ridiculous. What you have to do is you have to understand it's all about giving accurate diagnosis, followed by once you've got accurate diagnosis, you have a roadmap. And then once you have a roadmap, you then go with hemodynamics, biology, cosmesis. And that's the three stages. Does every single patient that comes to the Whiteley Clinic get a full scan, by which I mean, I, I, I assume from what you say, is they get a scan of their legs looking at the deep veins, the superficial veins, the perforators. Um, there are a heck of a lot of perforators, so presumably you, are you selective in the number of perforators that you, that you inspect, or do you inspect all the perforators of the leg? And does everybody who comes to the Whiteley Clinic get a full scan of their pelvic veins looking for reflux and obstruction? No. So what happens is every single patient comes to the Whiteley Clinic, if they come with a leg problem, 
gets a full scan of both legs. We never do one leg. I think that's ridiculous because venous disease affects both sides and you should know what's going on on the other side. So every single patient gets a full scan, deep veins, all the superficial veins, all the truncal veins, all the perforators on both sides. Takes uh, For a patient with not much going on, it might be 15 minutes per leg, but it's a 30 minute scan. In people with clip of Trelawney syndrome, recurrences, it can be a lot longer than that. But they all have every vein in the leg scanned. Um, and you can't be selective. If you want to find all the causes, you can't be selective. You have to. And that's why we only use our own trained vascular technologists, boys and girls who have been trained properly in full vascular technology, want to specialize in veins. They come to us fully trained and qualified, first of all, and then we retrain them solely in veins, and they do nothing but venous scans. And that's why they get the results they do. Now, one of the one of things we're misquoted a lot about is that some people seem to think we then scan the pelvic veins, which we don't. <clears throat> the only scan the pelvic veins is, number one, if when you're doing the scan, if they find there is reflux coming from higher in the, the higher than the inguinal ligament or uh, for coming from the paravulval region or in men coming from anywhere in the sort of uh, gonadal region or the uh, scrotal region, if there's something coming from above, clearly, you don't have a full answer. So then they get offered a, a, a pelvic scan, which is performed on a different day. And you have to, because you have to prepare the bowel if you're going to see through the bowel and you're going to see the pelvic scan. So you can't plan that beforehand. Now, we do have people who have read our uh, articles or seen me talk or seen the YouTube articles, realize that they've got pelvic veins. They can see they've got vulval varicose veins. They've got the varicose leading into leg veins. And they will preempt us and say, I know already from reading your book or reading all the things, I've got pelvic venous reflux. Those people, we will then plan to do the pelvis and the legs on the same day, and they'll be sent the, uh, the appropriate medications to clean the bowel in the, uh, in the day, but that, uh, and sorry, in the post beforehand, so they come ready. But it's not a routine. Now, we also have, because of our position where I've now become recognized as one of the leading lights in pelvic congestion syndrome, as you'll know, and pelvic venous disorders, we now have an increasing number of women and more commonly, more, more, uh, more latterly men who've got pelvic congestion syndrome who come to us and say, look, I haven't got leg vein problems at all, but I've got pain in my pelvis or I've got aching in my pelvis and the gynecologist or urologist is not quite sure what's going on. I'd like to be investigated. And those people come in and they only have the pelvic scan. So this idea that we just scan everything is wrong. What we do is we scan the problem area, but if it's your leg, you have to scan both to get a, a proper view of what's going on and then only include the pelvis or leg veins if it's indicated either clinically, um, the patient saying there's a problem, and also you can see reflux coming from uh, above. And just, for, just because I'm not sure I know enough about this, when you say you see some reflux coming from above, do you mean... Do you mean, where do you see the reflux on, when, you're in, when you're scanning the groin? Where do you see that reflux specifically? Well, of course, I don't scan because... Uh, cause no, I where does one? No, where does one? Um, so what, what you see <coughs> almost always is, is um, so if you're talking about female, it's usually if you look at the adductor longus tendon, if you look at that hard tendon right. on the inside yeah. of the leg, if it's coming from in front of that, it's usually saphenous. If on the other hand, you've got any veins at all behind that, it's almost always, it is definitely coming paravulvally. That's coming from pelvis. And I'll publish research from the comparison between NHS and private clinics um, showed that that's one in six women with leg varicose veins have got pelvic vein reflux significantly going into their leg veins. And our subsequent publications have also shown uh, that a very large number of uh, recurrences are due to those not being identified and not being treated. So, um, so that's why they always look. Now, what happens is if you put your probe around the corner and you see the reflux coming down there, or if you actually are scanning in the groin, but you can see these annoying veins that are refluxing and coming into the great sphere's vein, but from the anterior abdominal wall or the inguinal area, right. or in men coming across the, um, from the scrotal area, because we've now shown that a lot, there's a very healthy communication, as was shown in 1990s in the big Egyptian paper. There's quite a few links between the testicular vein and the um, uh, saphenous veins and the um, uh, internal iliac veins and external iliac veins. And those can go both ways, of course. And so you can actually have had a varicose or form and yet have a competent testicular vein or even a treated testicular vein. 
Now, we got into a big argument in phlebology when we wrote up and said, look, you know, we've got six men here, or oh, very men, I can't remember. We published a series of men. About one in 30 men with egg marrow stains have a significant contribution coming from their pelvis. And when we published that, everyone went, oh, no, 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 you know, this doesn't happen. The, the testicular veins are one-way street. It's like a motorway. It doesn't have any branches or tributaries. Um, and that's what they used to think about the ovarian vein. And that's why you get taught at medical school embryologically. In fact, it's rubbish. And if you actually look at any of the literature, the pampiniform plexus in the man uh, basically has lots of communications with the leg, lots of communications with the pelvic veins. If you look in a woman, the ovarian vein and the interlinic veins, the um, pituitary dental veins, it becomes a network of veins. And, and they are just all the last most together. And especially then when you get reflux and dilatation, you get very complex patterns. And just the same way that anyone who still thinks that leg varicose veins are great saphenous and small saphenous, and that's it. Um, and don't look at perforators and all the other problems that go on in legs. And they're the same sort of people who think that your, your pelvic veins are just ovarian or testicular veins. It's just, you know, a really simplistic way of looking. And the difficulty is then what happens is the majority of people only scan for what they want to find, which is trunk or vein reflux. They only treat it. And then they try to get some sort of outcome from that in papers, missing huge amounts of reflux coming from areas that they don't want to look at. And that's why I call these sorts of papers... And I've said in the uh, argument I've been having garbage in, garbage out research. If you don't actually find all the areas of pathology and you don't even try and correct those areas of pathology, then looking at outcomes is a fairly futile <laughs> thing to do. But I would have thought that for a scientist, I would have thought that very easy to understand. It's just, of course, what happens is we all get very upset because it's our practice that's been criticised, it's our professors that we used to respect being criticised. And this is what happens in science. You know, you push forward and you you make new discoveries. And there's always the technology adaptation cycle. You get the innovators, you get the early minority, the early majority, the late majority, and the laggards. We all know how it happens. And the trouble is, you know, you've got an awful lot of loud voices in the laggards and in the late majority and even in the early majority. So, you know, what you have to do is you have to lead people through the system and you have to point out to them that actually it's just not quite as simple as medical students at all. And because medical training in veins is so poor, because there isn't a consultant venous surgeon uh, job in the UK, therefore the medical schools and the colleges don't train people for venous surgery. So therefore, when I go to all the international vein uh, meetings where veins have become very, very popular worldwide, you hardly ever see any English doctors. And you know we see the same people there time and time again who are interested talking to each other. And each time, it's nice to see new people start to get interested, but they get flabbergasted. And most of them come up to you and sort of say, oh, my goodness, I realise that I'm just not treating veins very well. And you say, that's right. And so we're slowly getting the message out there. But it is, you know, it, it's very hard work. And as you see from the conversations we're having, you know, a lot of people doing it don't understand really the complexity of what they're doing. So give me a sense, Mark, of, of how many people will have... I mean, Standard practice, or you would call it a simple practice, is that people would get a leg scan. Most will have saphenous reflux and tributaries. And in most cases, the standard practice would not show any significant um, perforated disease and they wouldn't suspect any pelvic disease. In your practice, having looked at things very in a very detailed way, of a hundred people who come off the street with primary varicose veins, what percentage would you say are not the simple, straightforward ones that most specialists in the UK would recognise? Well, I think I don't even have to say what I think. I mean, it's, it's well published. So we know that if we're not talking about recurrences, we're talking about primary veins, at least 40% have got um, uh, incompetent perforating veins if you look for them. It's just people don't look for them. Um, and if you're talking about women, it's one in six have got significant pelvic vein reflux. And if you're talking about men, it's one in 30. So you're probably talking about 50% uh, overall, generally. What I can tell you is that in our practice, when people come to see us and they actually have a scan, because of the anterior accessory venous vein as well, and bifid systems, and a bit of uh, abnormalities, lateral side perforates, all different other things as well, above knee uh, and the parvar tissue, what we find is, to find someone who only has 
truncal vein reflux and varicosities is about 15 percent so answer, so answer your question answer your question of 100 people in the street if you're only looking for and treating truncal veins and and uh and uh, things only 15 out of 100 are getting the right diagnosis and treatment so am i right in thinking from what you're saying then is that of 100 people who come to the whiteley clinic 85 will have perforators treated or will have pelvic reflux disease treated as well as the saphenous trunks so what they would do if they come to the whiteley clinic is they'll have whatever's going wrong and causing their condition treated and so and that changes because of course as we become more well known for what we do, we actually have yes. an abnormal reputation. Now we've just um, uh, we've just actually recently had a, 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 a an external company came and did a review of some of our patients uh, for another company's interest in what we're doing, and we gave permission. And uh, they found and forty seven percent of our patients in the time period they looked at, which was a representative time period, have had bad treatment elsewhere that's recurred early. They've had between uh, one and five operations elsewhere and they've come to see us. So those are complex patients because they've already had somebody fiddling around with them. Of the rest of those people coming to us, we've got a proportion of clipper trilordi syndrome. People have been told they're either incurable or, they're, um, or they've had attempted treatment elsewhere that hasn't really worked. Uh, as I said, those are probably coming to the 47%. So it's people like clipper trilordi. We have a lot of people, especially leg ulcers, have been told they're incurable. Um, uh, we have all sorts of things coming as well, so it is quite difficult. So I would say uh, I would say that if people coming to the Whiteley Clinic, uh, the vast majority have to have perforated treatment as well, or neovascular treatment, um, or treatment of the kebab technique and the hedgehog technique, or we have to uh, look for you know strip trap ne neovascularization, parva tissue. So we do get you know complexities, which of course we've got techniques to do. It's all local anaesthetic, and they all get treated. Um, but what happens is every single person, and they all get given their results, they all get to told and explained fully to them. And of course, they, they then get told if they want to go elsewhere, that's no problem. Um, and we'll just see them when they've got their recurrences. So, you know, we're, we're very upfront and honest with it. And that's, you know, that's how we do it. So we have a stage thing. People come to see us, we do the diagnosis, we make our recommendation. We do the consent form on the day because the consent form is only our suggestion. Then we tell them to go away and think about it. And if they want to go elsewhere, no problem. If they want to come to us, no problem. And then when we treat them, they go into the process. And when we have people coming back with saying, you know, my veins recurred early or this sort of thing, which is very rare, but when we do see it, 99% of the time it's because they didn't complete the treatment. They decided they didn't want the power of veins treated when we said they should, or they didn't come back for the stage two. Uh, so there's almost always people who go through the system. It's very uncommon for them, but it does happen. You know, as in the Framingham study, and this was published, 3.3% per year will develop de novo veins. Now, the only thing in the Whiteley Clinic we ever accept is a de novo vein. So in other words, if we've treated great sphenous vein two perforators, and somebody comes back a year later and says, I've got a new vein, if it was a great sphenous vein or one of those perforators, you know, it's almost never, ever happens, but we do it for free. We just say, absolutely, goodness gracious, you know, and we go back and we find out who did the operation, what equipment they used, look for a, a problem because that's a failure of our treatment. Almost always what's happened is they've just now developed small sphenous vein reflux or they've got, you know, an anterior accessory sphenous vein's gone and it's a de novo uh, rate. Now, if we were missing it, if it was that the, uh, the original ultrasound wasn't good enough and we're missing it, then we wouldn't have a 3.3% recurrence rate. It would be way, way higher. But because it's actually right within the Framingham study of 3.0 uh, to 4.5% per year de novo rate, we know that we're not missing it. So that's how we can be so certain of our figures. Okay. So just to, just to humour me, because I'm a bit confused now, going back, I know you've got a very specialised referral cohort and that you're... you're population of patients is very different perhaps from the average but have you got a sense in your own mind of a hundred patients who have not had previous treatment um, who haven't suspected because of reading your website or your publications that they've got something like a pelvic congestion syndrome or they haven't they don't suspect they've got vulval varices I know that might be a minority of your practice but do you have a sense in your mind what percentage of those which would probably be treated 
in the vast majority of cases by endothermal ablation of the saphenous trunks and probably either phlebectomy or foam sclerotherapy. Of those that come to you, how many do you think should have had their perforators treated and some sort of pelvic intervention? Uh, so the question is, if they come to us, um, they will get or, treated. So yeah. Do, or, do, do, we, do we okay. get 100? You're saying 100. So basically, if 100 people came to us with the simplest of all of veins, who've got no other suspicion, probably something like, um, I would think probably about 30%, maybe 35% will have um, nothing else going on, maybe even up to 40%. We know that incompetent perforators is 40% of the population and powerful veins one in six. So that gives you, you know, that's, that, that gives you your, is about 40% don't have those things. So are you suggesting, therefore, from that, from that data that 60% of people being treated with endothermal ablation and sclerotherapy or phlebectomies are being treated incorrectly? Totally, absolutely. And if people are brave enough to join the College of Pornology Venus Registry, we'd show it within a couple of years. And that's, we see it time and time again. We see people come along with their invoices or their NHS letters and say, but I've had four operations. You know, this is what they And we scan them, nothing's been done. Or part of a great Venus vein is missing, whatever. Or even if they've had great, really, really good results because uh, in their trunkal vein, they've missed the four perforators underneath or the power veins. And those people are very, very upset. And that's why I've had that argument on your uh, recent leak thing for the American guy, because basically you can turn around and say, oh, but, you know, generally look at this group, you know, the problems are so much better. But that doesn't help the individual patient who says, I came to you with a problem and I wanted to have treatment and you just stuck foam in and did whatever. And you say, but the group of patients has a better problems. That doesn't help your patient. So we specialise on the individual and we turn around and say, we want that patient to be happy. What do they need? And then they go through that process. So, you know, okay. not only not only do I know that I, from, from our audit, but we also see it when people don't do that. Um, you know, the thing with it is, the, on clinic has been very successful because we treat people, people well, we get good results, and we put right things that have gone wrong elsewhere. But I don't hide it as a secret. I've published so much. I've written so many books and everything. And I've said to people, this is what you've got to do. But what ends up happening is the, the arguments then start coming around and people, rather than going on scientific arguments, suddenly start saying, oh, well, cost my patients won't afford this or, you know, or, you know, oh, that's what do I train? They'll come out with lots of other things because you know what doctors will do. They will alter the argument away from the science when they're not winning on the science. But it's a very clear, it's very clear. If you're just clear thinking, and you turn around and just say, we have a condition. The condition goes, blood cells have to get back from the tip of your toe to your heart. And they go up the veins and they're pumped up there. And if they fall out behind your knee, it's out of the small saphenous vein. And if they fall out in your groin, it's the great saphenous vein or anterior accessory. And we all accept those. That's all fine. But if you happen to fall out halfway up your tibia, is a perforator. Well, we don't want to treat perforators, we'll ignore that. Well, if it comes up, you know, so you have all those arguments. And you, when you get people to realize that you can have active or passive reflux and you can have more than one side of reflux in length, and you get them to, you say, and then why aren't you looking at the veins from the groin to the heart? Why do you think that all of a sudden you can get leak points and reflux below the groin, but they call varicose veins, but suddenly you ignore it when it's in the pelvis because take away the emotional side of it being deep inside. Of course, it's exactly the same problem. You've got you've got tributaries going in with valves that become incompetent. And when they reflux, you get problems. So it's not, you know, this whole idea of pelvic veins causing late varicose veins and everybody be shocked about it. Nobody should be shocked about that. That's about, that's about the same as being shocked because the great saphenous vein above the knee is causing a reflux as well as the swan below the knee. I mean, it's just part of the system that has had the same pathophysiology going wrong and reflux. But it, the reflux ends up in the pelvis and ends up causing pelvic congestion, all the problems there, or leaks through leak points into the leg and then causes leg problems. It's, it's not a conceptual. If I take somebody who's never trained in medicine, I explain it, they go, well, this is obvious. You then get somebody who's been indoctrinated by medical school and by lots of people afterwards, and they go, but I don't do that, you know, that's, that's wrong. And you get really, <laughs> as I found over 20 years, you get people getting really upset by something that is absolutely as obvious as the nose on your face. 
Okay. So tell me, if, if a vein specialist who's currently not doing the Whiteley Protocol wanted to follow the Whiteley Protocol, what would they have to do? Oh, very simple. I mean, we run courses. We run courses for years and years and years. Um, and we do it now, now through the College of Biology because we've had to split up our time into doing it. And so it's just basically the College of Biology um, fellowship course is basically teaching people the science behind the Whiteley Protocol. And what if people wanted to read in detail the Whiteley Protocol? What would they have to do? Uh, well, I, the, the thing with it is, is as is explained on the fellowship, you have to understand the pathophysiology. You have to understand what the duplex can and can't show and when you need other tests. And you have to understand the way the devices work and the, um, the, the, the why some veins will respond to one treatment and some veins to the other. So if you wrote it as in this case, in this case, you'd actually have to write a protocol that envisaged every single possibility, which would, because patients are individual, every, every patient in the world. So the principles are obvious, but if you want to really understand it, what you have to do is you then have to just read everything I've written before, or I teach people if they don't want to read all that. But, you know, I've, I've wrote a thing recently, um, uh, a big paper on the current management of varicose veins, and I, I put all of this in there. You know, but it, it's just like the, the you know this thing you wrote about you know foam scope that is all you need. We we know that's not true, and um, that's why I got into the argument with this guy because we know from our publication 2016 when we showed. If you put foam sclerotherapy into a trunkal vein, it only affects the first 200 to 300 microns of the vein wall. It does not affect the right out to 500, 600 microns. If the adventitia is still alive, you know you're going to get recanalization. So you just know that if you follow this patient long enough, they're not going to get a good result. That is not a clever way of treating a vein. If you know, uh, you know, as one of our famous colleagues once presented, you know, he said it matters not one whit which way you thrombose a great severe vein, they all work the same. Well, if you think thrombosis is what you're aiming for, you shouldn't be doing veins. You're looking for fibrosis. Fibrosis comes from transmural um, uh, death, which is what we published in 2004. All you have to do is look at the devices and say, for this size of vein, with this wall thickness, not diameter of vein, but wall thickness, and in this position, the way to get transmural death is this, this, this. Then if you follow the protocol, which is simply correct diagnosis, hemodynamics, biology, cosmesis, and then with the, path, with the person in front of you, you then actually say, well, these veins are the ones that are causing the hemodynamic problem. We're going to fix those. And because it's this size and this size, we use that tool and this size and this size, we use this tool. You put that together as one package. That's stage one, wait. Then you come back and do the second package, stop the stasis, stop everything else. And then if they want cosmetic treatments, they can have it. Now, some people don't need all of it. You know, some people only need stage three, some people only need stage one. But what happens is if you, if you actually understand the protocol, then you under, then, and you actually have done your research, either by reading our stuff or looking at us about how laser works, how radio frequency works, how mocker works, how all things, you can actually then choose the right treatment or range of treatments that can be used for each individual pattern. But to turn around and sort of say, you know, where's the protocol written? You know, you just, it, 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 it's, it's, there's as many different ways of utilizing it as there are patients. But the principles, you get the same, it's, it's more or less like, you know, driving a car. You learn the principles of how to drive a car and what the roadsides are, but you don't turn around to somebody and say, right, you know, on this specific junction, in this specific town, you do this. And then that specific junction, that's ridiculous. What you do is you teach people the rules, you teach people the way to do it. And then when they come across a situation, they go, oh, yes, I know how to do this. I follow this instruction, this instruction. And that's that's what the way the protocol is. And it's sparklingly simple, but unfortunately, as I said to, to your colleague or intimated to the, on, the, um, on the LinkedIn chat, you know, it does take a bit of work to read it and to actually understand it. If you're expecting a company to come along and say, here's a new device, just use it like this, here's the IFU, you're not going to, you're not going to do very well. And if you, if you only have one device or one procedure in your armamentarium, you're definitely not going to be able to treat all the patients who turn up to see you. Okay. So... If, if a vein specialist coming off the training program wanted to learn the Whiteley Protocol, your recommendation is to do one of your courses and to join the College of Phlebology, is that right? 
Uh, but uh, I would be, be worried about saying there's a vein specialist coming off well, because I'm not. All right. Because, because all right. Also, so, somebody who wants to be a vein specialist because they're thinking they've right. actually done their higher training. They, they won't be a vein specialist. They may call themselves that, and they often do. But And then from yeah. our point of view, yeah, at the moment, um, you know, we set up the college of biology because purely and simply there is no proper training, certainly in the UK and worldwide. There's a few people training at the moment, but a lot of it is very, very, if you look at it, it's not based on a lot of science. So we set up the College of Biology in 2011 to do the training. Um, and the uh, because I founded it, obviously, it's based on, for superficial veins and all that, it's based on the Whiteley Protocol. And that's what the fellowship's in. Now, we also, the College of Biology has expanded and more and more doctors have joined the College of Biology now. And there are areas that I don't speak on, I don't know about, and like deep veins, for instance, you know, and there are lots of world experts on deep veins. And I, I, I absolutely hold my hands up. If I don't know something, I, you know, I just say I don't know that. And, you know, my print, the principles of this, but we have people like um, Professor um, Pasuak from uh, uh, Turkey, who does a lot of our training on that and stenting. So, you know, there are other courses as well. But if people want to do an office based superficial venous uh, surgery, which is what most of us do, and they want to understand that, that's where we teach. So either people who come and work at the Whiteley Clinic, in which case obviously they get indoctrinated into the way we treat it, uh, but if people want to get have that same understanding, but from without, then we do it through the fellowship. And how much is the fellowship? Um, I, I can't remember, it's on the website. Uh, uh, we have a manager who runs it uh, called Omer, uh, and he, he 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 runs it. Um, I know that we've recently um, uh, people found that they couldn't come to us because it was for six weeks at a time, and we do sort of modify it a bit because some people have got no background in veins and some people have got a lot of background in veins, and so we so we tend to modify it a bit. So what we've recently done is we've actually made it into four weeks online, and then two weeks coming one week observing and one week actually doing so to prove they've got the ideas behind it. And that will give people, it won't make them experts in the whole of the protocol on the way forward, but it will certainly give them a very, very good basis, a very, very good grounding to grow from there. And then what we do through College of Biology after that is we then provide a support network. We've got WhatsApp groups and we've got other other um, uh, uh, websites where uh, uh, with social media where people, if they've got a problem, they, they post and say, what do I do in this case? What do I do? And so we then support them through their, their practice afterwards. And we end up with a very good community around it. So, um, so as I say, the, the, the actual price is slightly variable depending on the specific needs for the, the person doing it. Um, Ballpark but, figure? Oh, but it's about £10,000 or something like that, I think. If £10,000. Well, it's something like that. It, um, if they're going for the full one and they're then coming and actually doing the um, observe, observe week and also operating on patients. Hmm. That's good. And um, whilst, I'm, whilst I remember and thinking about price, how much does it cost for a patient coming off the street to go through the assessments, consultation, it, it scans? Depends exactly, it depends exactly what's wrong with them, but the basic is something like about £980, I think, or £940, about £980. And what basically the thing with that is, is, you know, consultant's time is a certain element of that because there's two consultations, a preliminary and the second one. And then they get scanned by someone who, as I've explained, is going to spend an hour doing the scan and the write up and the report, um, who's highly qualified using you know, one of the top of the range, uh, things like an Epic 7 or an Epic 5. It's phenomenally expensive equipment. And so what people should really be saying is, if it's not costing that, where are they cutting corners? Because if you're not charging, if, you, if you're not charging, either the consultant is not valuable valuing their time, if they're not using the top of the range equipment and they're not using a basket technologist who is hourly rate is very high and also has to pay their insurance in case they get it wrong. Anyone who's cutting corners is either getting a suboptimal service or they're being bribed by saying, well, there is there is value to this, but we're not going to charge you for it because we want you to come and pay us. So in very simple business terms, people should really worry about cheap or free consultations or cheap or free you know, sort of uh, uh, um, medicine in any case, because you should really say, where's the cost being hidden? Who's picking up the bill? Because somebody's got to pay for the trained people to do it. Somebody's got to pay the equipment. Somebody's got to pay for the electricity and the ground rent. They've got to pay for the research. They've got to pay for all the things they give it. And if and they've got to pay for you know, disposables as well, it comes through. So 
there's a real problem with this idea and for the England in particular, where the NHS is free at the point of delivery, that, you know, it's all oh, money going to private practice. You've run a business before, you know, there are bills. And if you have top of the range equipment and top of the range people, if that person's, if the person's not going to come and pay for it when they have the service, then you have to get it back from somewhere, which means you're either cheating them or lying to them or not providing the service. So we're absolutely upfront. We're saying, you see a very well-trained consultant who will take full responsibility for everything they see and say to you. We're going to then, you're going to have a top of the range uh, uh, scan done by someone who is fully trained, not only externally, but then has our training on top and our seal of approval. And you're going to have a full report and you're going to be given at the end of that a, a completed package with a recommendation, which you can do with what you like. You have paid a appropriate amount for the expertise you have had for the equipment of the people you've had and as i say to you although people like to talk about you know say it's expensive it's not expensive when you consider what's in there and what i would say is anyone who's not charging that sort of stuff you they've got to turn around and say well just you know where are they cutting their corners um you've been quite critical publicly on youtube your website and other media of specialists who do their own scan, are you of the opinion that a suitably trained vascular surgeon should not be doing his own diagnostic scans? Uh, yeah, he should, you, 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 you think that's... Absolutely, So, because just think about it. Just think about it. So basically, number one, you use the word vascular surgeon. So vascular surgeon, if you're a vascular surgeon, you're doing arteries, you're doing aortic aneurysms, you're doing ward rounds, you're doing bypass, you're doing carotids. There is absolutely no time that you are going to keep up the skills in the week to make sure that your duplex ultrasound scanning skills on veins is as good as someone who does it nine to five, day in, day out. You just not. That's why you don't treat. That's why people who do that do not end up doing uh, finding perforators or parva because they just do a three point scan. They just quickly look at, oh, it's a great sphenous vein refluxing. It's a small sphenous vein. And you can t see because they often call it long sphenous or short sphenous, which is 20 years out of date, as we know from the UIP. So, you know, people, the people who are doing that just are not providing their patients a good uh, service because they are not keeping their skills up. Even people who do veins day in, day out, if you're talking to patients and operating on patients and do all the other things you have to do as a doctor, you're not going to be doing more than one or two diagnostic scans a day, maybe three maximum. You're not going to be sitting there looking for every perforated, blah, 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 or the parvot tissue, all the different complexities. And that's why you end up with saying, well, the worst bit's here, the worst bit's there, and we'll just do that. So I would say you, fine for the doctors to do their own scans if you want to, but you have to be honest to the patient to say, we're going to do, you know, a, a sort of that best a mediocre job. I also <laughs> think there's also another problem. I think there's also a, a poor eye principle problem. And we know that there's an ascending reflux. And so we know that the great sphincter thing starts refluxing from the bottom upwards, not the top down. So quite often you have a competent top of the vein but income would lower down. There's a real choice. At, at what point do you say, I'm going to ablate that whole vein when I know it's normal at the top, but it's abnormal lower down? And there's a real complexity there. And so what, when you turn around, and I was involved in a uh, look at arm's length with a uh, doctor who um, filed, filed with the GMC by doing his own scans. And what he was doing, he was saying that every single person had to have a great severe vein and small sphenous vein um, uh, endovenous laser, uh, endovenous radiofrequency ablation. And he was charging everybody had to have ablation of both truncal veins on both sides. And when it transpired, he, uh, one of the patients came to us and they only had thread veins. Their, their great severe and small severe were completely normal. They were going to be charged for ablation of, a, of two truncal veins. And when this person was examined, it turned out they'd be doing that, they'd be a fallen file of GMC for doing the same thing two years before and still doing it. And more importantly, they weren't even scanning right. They were lying the patient flat for Bragg Spain. So it was totally inappropriate. But because that doctor was doing their own scan and no one was checking, there's no four-eyed principle technique. Nobody else was looking over their shoulder saying, oh, hang on a second, I didn't say that. They got away with it for years and years and years. And of course, the hospital they worked in didn't mind because they were earning the money as well. That doctor ended up having to leave the country, uh, was uh, basically sanctioned, and it was all over the internet. And so, on. so I wrote to the College of Surgeons, who never replied. I wrote to the GMC, who did reply. I wrote to the um, UK Specialist Association, I can't remember. I wrote to everyone and said, 
this patient, this doctor's done this. I mean, no, all these doctors, if you look on the website, say, I do my own scan, you know, you get it done cheaply, etc. I said, can you just assure us that the same thing isn't happening worldwide, countrywide? You know, how can we make sure that the doctors who are treating these people, apart from saying, I'm honest, how can you make sure that these people aren't actually uh, ripping people off? And the college researcher wouldn't answer at all. I've answered, I've sent them three different letters, two of them registered to the president and one to the standards committee, and they didn't answer. And all the other authorities I wrote to, to wrote back to me and said, this is not, this is not a problem. Uh, we, this is, we don't have to look at this. So my, my worry with this is, is I think there's, I think there's twofold. I don't think that anyone can do a couple of scans occasionally and be as good as someone who's scanning every single day. And we know that from the, you know, all the different publications that we've done on repetition and pattern recognition. We know that you have to be doing something constantly to get a good result. But also there's the honesty point as well. And there's two things. I've written this up in research papers. It's not new. And, you know, it's my views. And I, you know, I, I, the only people who, who criticize it are people who will say, well, I don't do that. So therefore, I'm going to criticize you. But it's a fairly obvious thing. And if it was in the banking world or any other world, everybody would say, well, this is obvious. There's a third thing as well is and that's sort of everyone who comes on our course, when they have to do the trollop technique or the hedgehog technique or the kebab technique, they soon find that this is impossible to do it unless you've got three hands. You cannot get into a perforator uh, that's only three millimeters in size, and you cannot hold that needle in exactly the right place, and you can't get the laser in, and then the local anesthetic, and close it, and keep it imaged to make sure you're not damaging anything else with only two hands. So when you're in theater, you definitely need to have someone else doing it, and they have to be a skilled person who knows how to look at the vein as well. So there's, you know, there's that which isn't on the diagnostic side, but certainly, you know, I, I think that uh, I, I think that doing your own scans is, uh, I know there are certain countries where by law they have to do it. I think we're lucky in, to be in a country where that's not the case. And so we can offer our patients the very, very best that's available. But the fact that doctors don't do is usually down to a commerce and not patient um, uh, patient care. That. That did cause a lot of consternation when you asserted that, Mark. Yeah, well, it will do because people, what I'm doing is I'm criticising people who are doing what I believe is poor treatments. And I think if they looked in their hearts, I think if you had an independent, if this ever sort of reached, uh, you had an independent panel looking at it and all the evidence was brought forward, I don't think they'd be actually um, looked at. Uh, they, from inside the profession, everyone might pat on and say, oh, well, let's close ranks. But from outside, when people, if they truly understood the, the processes, truly understood the cost of having recurrences and having poor results, I think that our, most people who, who were, um, started off without a vested interest would come down on my side because they do in every other industry where there's any sort of uh, <laughs> where there's any um, uh, outcome, whether it be commercial or personal, um, whether there's a for, uh, whether you have somebody who's expert doing it all the time, um, whether action is taken, whether you when you then ablate the evidence, the evidence is gone, and the proof, you know, unless you unless you've got some other way of uh, documenting exactly that that the can never be checked. You don't have an X-ray or an MRI. You don't have a, something there. You only have what people have written, and we all know you can selectively keep a, an ultrasound scan and say, oh, that bit of reflux. Oh, yes, no, I was holding the probe there. It just, you know, it doesn't it doesn't pass muster, and it is only so, it's only the fact you... that we've got here. Sorry. By, so it's only the fact that we've got here by tradition. People have accepted it for so long that it continues. But I think, I think in the future, if people get interested in the area and do look at it, I don't think that I'll be on the losing side. Do you think there's a lot of dishonesty and fraud amongst doctors then treating veins? I don't know. Can't answer that. I never looked at it. But the implication from what you said when you made this statement, and you actually also added the comment about this clearly rogue doctor. Well, I would hope he was a rogue doctor, a dishonest doctor, who was fraudulently treat, over-treating, the implication that some um, who treat veins is that, that there's a lot of dishonesty that needs to be rooted out and that Professor so Whiteley is going to, think, Professor Whiteley is going to do it. I, th I think that what you're doing is you're trying to make an argument, which I'm not making an argument. What I've said is here's an example of someone who did it frankly dishonestly 
um, and the, uh, uh, the, it was found out. What we do know, however, is we do know there's massive recurrence rates. So there's a lot of people who are getting their scans, not, for, not doing very good scans or not doing very good treatments. They're not being honest because they're not joining the College of Biology Venus Registry and not producing registry data, so they can't be checked. Now, whether you're saying they're dishonest or just they're doing inadequate scans because they're doing their own scans, well, you know, I, I don't, I don't really mind from my point of view. I, I'm not going to accuse anyone of being one or the other, but I think that they're not doing their patients a service. No. Okay. Um, what was I going to ask next? Well, that that's helpful because um, I did ask my colleagues. I had a little ask around for some questions I was going to ask Professor Whiteley when I spoke to him, and one of the questions was. Are you critical? Are you saying that doctors in all cases should have their scans done by an independent person, a trained technician? Uh, and are you saying that in the operating th or in the treatment area, in the office room, a vascular technician needs to be present as well, even though by their standards, having done an approved course and had appraisals and CPD, they regard themselves as adequately trained in uh, ultrasound. So, so if a doctor does their own scan in, in theatre, we can answer that one first, it's very easy. Yeah. You can rest assured that they're not doing any complex techniques. Right. Because it's, it's absolutely impossible to do trollop procedure, hedgehog procedure, any of the complex things. So you know instantly they're, they're performing Mickey Mouse surgery, they're doing just the truncal veins and just the simple stuff. And so, any patient, and um, the majority of patients, at least 50%, who have the perforated parva or everything else, are not going to get good results. So it, it's a fairly clear thing that, that if you're not having a second person, now whether it's another doctor who's trained in ultrasound doing it, and you, it doesn't have to be a vascular technologist, might be a radiologist, might be a, a, a surgeon who's decided I'm only going to do scans every day, I'm going to work with my colleague. That doesn't matter. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not sort of saying it has to be a set of qualifications, provided or sort of provided they are adequate at doing it. But you don't have three hands. You can't do it yourself. So anyone who's in theatre and not using a second person who is trained to do the scan is clearly not doing the sort of techniques that the majority of people need. And especially if you've got clipper schlawner syndrome, if you've got recurrent varicose veins, or something, you're just not going to get good results. Now, if doctors decide to do their own scans, then what uh, the, the big question you've got to ask is, do you really think that you're going to be getting as good results as someone who scans from nine to five day in, you know, five days a week? The, the answer is completely no. And you'll see that. And if people actually join the registry, so they actually were the open with their data, and they actually showed, you see very, very clearly that they were only treating truncal veins and almost no perforators and almost no power veins. And then you'd see the problems and you'd see the uh, recurrence rates over two, three, four years because the registry goes on for 10 to 15 years. And we haven't got an end date of it. It just keeps going on that patients get the emails. And the great thing with the College of Biology Venus Registry is it's not doctor filled in. The doctor puts the patient in anonymously and then the patient fills in all of the data. It comes in, the doctor has no influence on it. The uh, Aberdeen Varicose Vein Questionnaire and the recurrence goes to the patient and it gets sent back and the doctor has no influence on it. And then that data is then uh, available for all. Um, and so the whole, the, the, if, if, if doctors were being honest, and they really thought that they were good at scanning, then just join the registry, prove it, and five years' time I'll say sorry to you because I know it won't be the case. How can they join the registry, Mark? Very simple. It's, just, uh, it's free to everyone who's a member of the College of Phlebology. So you just join and, the College of Phlebology. It's your part of your membership. And how do you join the College of Phlebology? Just go online, click Be a Member, and join. Okay. Is there a fee for that? Mark? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because that's what pays for the registry, because there's an awful lot of people involved in maintaining the registry, in sort of running the courses and everything else. But it's, okay. I think for a, for a doctor who, I believe it's £399 a year for a doctor who is um, uh, fully qualified and got a practice. And then there are for juniors and for nurses or vascular technologists, uh, it's less. So we keep the prices as low as possible. And you, they not only get, they get cheap, um, they get discounts on conferences, courses, um, they get support. There's whole loads of other things that come as part of the membership. But we also decided to make the registry free to members because we didn't want to have this sort of a, a block because there's lots of other advantages to being a member of the College of Biology. So we, what we thought is if we add another fee for the registry, but people off doing the registry ways, in fact, 
for the future of venous surgery when you you and I are dead and long gone and sort of, you know, there's the next generation coming through and we're building on evidence. This real evidence we need to have is registry data. It's where you okay. don't have selection criteria. You don't have these ridiculous RCTs where you, know, you start off with a thousand patients and after exclusion, you've only got 72 left. And, you know, and then you try and get some sort of uh, some sort of meaning out of it, you know, the, the registry data is proper data because you see what did the patient have, what did the doctor do, and what equipment did they use, and then what did the patient get for the next 10 to 15 years. And when you've got that sort of data, then we will have real, uh, and that's real, real world data. How much longer have you got, Mark? So I'm mindful you've got other commitments. Eight minutes. Eight minutes. All right, quickly. Um, Spider veins, reticular veins and spider veins. You use Varixio. I've been asked by a colleague to ask you what sclerosant you use and what concentration. Very good question. So first of all, most important thing, must have a duplex, must have any underlying reflux removed. About 90% of people have underlying reflux. Do not even start doing it without doing that. So that's a, always preface that. One strategy, you, Varixio is amazing, and um, I don't want to, and I have to say, I am now an investor in it, so I have to be absolutely honest with it, because as soon as I saw it, I, uh, Henri, who invented it, is a friend of mine, and I just went to him and said, because they were trying to promote it for trunk base, I said, you're missing a trick, because uh, I use a, a 30 gauge needle, 31 gauge needle, a little yellow needle, and it's the only foam I've ever had that when you inject it through, that comes out as foam still at the other end, if you use 0.25% polydocanol, which is what I use. And so if you use 0.25% polydocanol, which doesn't leave brown stainings, it's incredibly good, provided you have compression for a minimum of two weeks and preferably three weeks to stop any uh, backfill, to have such a low concentration, the detergent level so low, if you try to use tasari and then put it through a little needle, it just comes out as basically fluid um, with a couple of bubbles. But the Brixio, the, the bubbles are so fine that the even with such a low concentration of detergent, you actually inject it and you just see it just go away. It's fantastic. The, the difficulty on the business side is um, what ends up happening is what you used to do um, uh, with a certain amount of uh, time or a certain amount of um, uh, uh, substance um, in, in four or five sessions, you now do in one session because the bricks ah. are just it spreads. So, so your patients get a superb result but, uh, but it means you get fewer people coming to see you time and time again. Sounds like you're a big fan of Varixio. Oh, yeah. And well, as I say, you know, it's not quite, I'm, in... I'm not quite the same as the, that bloke in the past who said I liked it so much I bought the company because I didn't. I was going to say. I really went and invested in it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Right. Another quick fire thing. Cyanoacrylate. Do you still use yeah, yeah. it? No. You do? What? No. No. Mocha. Mo Mechanico chemical ablation. Yeah. Do you use it? No. Right. What else do we? What else can we agree on? Um, no, no, no. I can, I can come out why with the, the, if you want to talk about it. But no, no. You've got. You've only got eight. You've got probably only six minutes, Mark. I've got some questions right. to ask right. you. Um, right. Um, okay. La another question. Um, if the Whiteley protocol gives the best results in the world with the lowest recurrence, work, recurrence rate in the world, why isn't it more widely used around the world? I know. We, we use it. I can't do more than use it myself and teach everybody around me. If other people don't want to use it and learn it, not my fault. I mean, if, if, people, if people knew more about it, they might come and learn it. I mean, the thing is, you've also got to remember the Wiley Protocol. It's a living thing. If you come out with a better technique, I'll nick it and use it in the Wiley Protocol. I'll okay. Read all, right. the papers all the time. So the point is with it, if anybody comes out with something better, it's included in the Whiteley Protocol. So I'm not turning around okay. and saying, I've invented something and it's better than yours. What I'm saying is, I collect the best science that I can, distill it and put it in the protocol. Yeah, but I don't know hey. anybody in the... Hey, Mark, I don't know anybody in the UK who does the Whiteley Protocol. No, Why no, is that? Know. I don't know anybody in the UK who treats veins properly, or most do their own quick scans. Most only do, you know, they don't do, they don't do look at the biological element. They only look at the hemodynamic element. Most people who do veins in the UK do not understand veins purely and simply. They're trained at a medical school level. They got taught, you know, how to do a few bits and pieces. They do it, and they don't come to the meetings. They don't come to the international meetings. 
They don't come to the research. They don't actually do this as they have no idea of the cellular and tissue biology. They have no idea of the hemodynamics. You know, there's 20 to 25 years work since, uh, since radio frequencies first came in and laser, where we actually suddenly realized that veins were not the way we taught. Uh, we, you, we have these fantastic, I go around the world all the time. I meet the same people all the time from different countries. And we have these amazing conversations and we discover so much. And are there any English doctors there? No. The few that turn up go off and do the politics and don't come to the science bits. Mark, I heard a colleague say recently, he hasn't seen you in the UK meet at any UK meeting for years. What's going on, Mark? So number one, I don't get invited. And I, I'm so busy now, I only ever go to places I'm invited to speak. Um, and uh, I was invited. The one I was invited to recently um, was I was invited to the, uh, I think it's called the FYA in January. And it was the Italian doctor. And he asked the English uh, uh, doctor to invite me. Um, and a couple of weeks later, I got a, a thing through LinkedIn saying, oh, you haven't answered yet from the Italian doctor. And I said, well, I haven't heard about it. And the English doctor had purposely not invited me and not told anyone. So the Italian doctor oh. who runs it uh, invited me himself. And I must say, there were a lot of shaking people when we were in the room because there was a lot of nonsense spoken. Um, and uh, when, when I, I said, I don't want to be too controversial, but I'm just going to point out that what you've said is, and I tried to do some sort of you know, sort of obvious things. And I, I did have this one lovely thing where a certain colleague turned around and said, well, I don't believe what you said. I said, well, it's a shame because what I've just ex explained to you is in fact published research and also one legal case. So it's not whether you agree or not, it's factual. And I'm just trying to help you. <laughs> that's, that's the sort of level it is. Okay, and what was the last thing? Um, here's the other thing, Mark. From a purely practical and utilitarian approach, there aren't enough vascular technicians, there aren't enough people trained in the Whiteley Protocol, there aren't enough catheters and ablation kits in the world to treat everybody who's currently suffering with a leg ulcer. Isn't it fair to say then that ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy is the only practical solution we have to this public health problem. Uh, well, you're, you're asking the wrong person, aren't you? If you talk, talk to a politician or a public health doctor, I'm here, as I've said right from the beginning, the Whiteley Protocol is based to get the person who is in front of me the very best treatment. And the person in front of anybody who I've trained to get the very best treatment. If you want to start talking about politics and about co uh, economics and everything else and provision and education, there's, there's someone else's problem. My, my problem is to train doctors who are interested in getting the best results to get the best results and to make sure they're trained in a way that the patient in front of us is getting the best results. Now, I know when I go around the world, I mean, the, uh, I think um, Ronald Bush did a brilliant thing when he invented the TRIS method um, for foam sclerotherapy around an ulcer. So that, so that you actually get a healing of the subulsal plexus or the dermal subdermal plexus if you do it. But we all know, as is he, that the recurrence rate is huge because he hasn't treated the perforators and the trunkal veins. So we know that you could do it, but it's not going to last that long. And you have to keep redoing it and redoing it. Then you have the risks of DVT and everything else because foam is incontrollable. You can't stop it going into the deep veins. And if you want to get enough into the perforator to treat it, you're also going to bugger up the deep veins. Oh, sorry, you're going, to, you're going to ruin the deep veins as well. So, you know, something like laser is precise. So, so you know, the, the whole idea is I, I am always going to strive to get the very best for my patients in front of me. And any doctor who wants to learn, I, I will technologist, I'll learn, I'll teach them. We will still train our technologists. We also helped recently, we had a girl who was our research fellow. We helped her into being uh, the technology, um, uh, vascular technologist, and hopefully she's going to come back and work with us later. She might not. You know, we can only encourage that, but um, I can only uh, tackle some things. I'm not a politician. I'm not an economist. I don't have any purse strings. I don't have any uh, position on any training board nationally or internationally. So I can't answer provision of, uh, of resources questions because that, that's just not in my remit. Lastly, because I know you've got to go. And I'm very, first, lastly, I'd like to say thank you very much, Mark. I know you're very busy and I know you're involved in all sorts of research and, and, uh, and you're one of the people that pu has published more in the last few years than I know. But anyway, that aside, um, the person you've been having this debate with on LinkedIn is Chris Pittman. Um, he doesn't mind being out in the public domain. He'll, 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 uh, he'll argue the case. And he's probably, 
I would regard one of the world's experts in foam sclerotherapy. Would you be prepared to have a debate with him? I, I, I wouldn't mind, but I mean, as I say, the, the, the trouble with the, the one thing I'd say about debates, I've been in many of them, and I've seen certain of our colleagues uh, argue that they used to be um, in Veith and in Charing Cross. They become they yeah. become a they become a joke because what happens is is they used to turn around and we all get used to debates. And what you do is you stand up and they used to give you one side of an argument in one side of the day. Then the next, the next meeting, you had to argue the same one, but on the other side. So you see people argue just to win a debate is irrelevant. What's important is the science. And, you know, the science of foam is just so obvious. If you can see that if you accept transmural death is required, and you know that you cannot get more than 300 microns deep, even with 3% SDS foam, until you prove you do that, and the, the vein wall is 500 microns, you know it's not going to be adequate for trunk of If you also accept that a perforator is probably about a centimetre and a half long, and to get enough foam into it, you have to flood that perforator, but then not think you're going to destroy the deep vein underneath it, it's just ridiculous. So uh, you know, if I need to have a debate, then fine, but it doesn't matter who wins or loses because at the end of the day, the important thing is the science. And you know, debates are all about you know trying to get people to look at it or whatever. Um, but the reality is the science. I mean, what is what is better is to do um, like they did in the European Journal of Vascular Surgery um, uh, and the um, Journal of Vascular Surgery in America where they had what's called the transatlantic debate. And I was invited to put my views on perforators down. And they had uh, uh, Professor O'Donnell in America. And that was fantastic because what happened is we both had time to actually consider it and to write our views and write the bits down. And because that people can go in perpetuity can own, and they can actually consider it. So it's not who's most eloquent and it's not who gets most aggressive and there's no emotion to it. It's purely and simply factually. And that changed many people's minds about perforators because, again, once you put the logic to someone, it doesn't matter who wins the debate. The logic and the science actually uh, overshadows everything else. Well, I, for one, would find it extremely educational. Um, I'm not suggesting a slanging match. I'm suggesting two prepared presentations. Uh, science, you versus Chris Pittman. I'm, and I'm, not, I'm certainly not averse to it at all because I think as long as it's as long as it's all about science, because it's so obvious, it's fair, it's, 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 it's an obvious thing. <laughs> well, <laughs> here's the thing. Here's the thing, Mark. I think there's an opportunity here because the the Whiteley Protocol, you assert, and I, I have no reason to doubt it. it it has the lowest recurrence rate in the world, and and also, and also it uses a lot of foam. We use loads and it of also... foam, but but you okay. use it. Late, but you use it when it's needed. You don't try and close everything with it. That's what I said to Chris. I mean, you know, if you've got an eighty-four millimeter great saphenous vein, as I've done, and I've closed with radio laser using the multi-pass technique, do you really think that's going to close with foam? If you've got Clibotolani syndrome, you've got 30 perforators. Are you just going to stick, keep on sticking foam into it again and again and again? Or are you going to cure that person properly by doing trollop technique and then foam over the top of it? So foam is an adjunct. It's not a full treatment for most people. That's all. Okay. Well, I'm not anti -foam well let, let's, let's put that. Well, uh, just last. I've got another last question. How many last questions can I have? Well, uh, I'm uh, the kids, so. <laughs> okay. Phlebectomy, are you against foam for tributaries? No, no, I, I often use foam for tributaries. It depends on size. So it depends on size and, of vein and on wall diameter. So I often use phlebectomies, often use foam, often use both. Great. Mark, Mark, you've been very generous with your time. I'll tell you what, I'll set up an invitation. We'll see what happens, eh? Lovely. Thank okay. you very much, Mark. I've been very generous with your time. I'm very grateful. Very interesting discussion. Thank you. There you are. I now have a better understanding of Mark Whiteley's approach, and five thoughts come to mind straight away. Firstly, from a practical point of view, few providers, at least in the UK, have the resources to implement the Whiteley protocol in full. It takes a considerable capital investment. For example, high-end ultrasound equipment. As Mark insists, portable machines 
just won't cut it. Secondly, even if a health provider were to take the Mark Whiteley Fellowship, it's difficult to source the vascular technicians who can provide the diagnostic scans or who even have the time to provide that support in the treatment room. Thirdly, the Whiteley Protocol may work in the Whiteley Clinic and in a few selected clinics, but the increased technical complexity may be associated with more complications if it were adopted more widely. Put more simply, the protocol may work in Mark Whiteley's hands with great results and a low complication rate, but in other people's hands, it might not. Fourthly, the increased operational costs of providing this protocol mean that only a few very wealthy patients have access to the protocol. And lastly, in common with a lot of other treatment modalities, we don't have randomised trials comparing the Whiteley Protocol with more widely practised procedures. So in summary, let me say this. I'm impressed by the dedication that Professor Whiteley shows in providing the best possible treatment to his patients, but I can see why the Whiteley Protocol hasn't been widely adopted. What do you think? Are you a Whiteley fella and have you adopted the protocol? Drop me a comment below. Now I've put a link to Professor Mark Whiteley and his full biography in the description box below. And if you found this interesting, please support my channel with a thumbs up and please consider sharing it with your colleagues. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you in my next video.